The existential threat posed by the climate emergency requires immediate action. Rapid decarbonisation is the primary focus and this could create immediate opportunities as well as stimulating long-term sustainable development. But it's also highly disruptive. Weather information is a critical element in the solution. On the one hand, we need to cope with weather extremes, and on the other, we need to better inform day-to-day -day decisions related to the implications of heat and air quality, transportation networks, energy supply and demand, and food and water security. In many areas of economic activity, short, medium and long-term planning is crucial, and increasingly accurate and reliable weather predictions provide essential foresight and consequential economic opportunities. While that's what some of us in the global weather enterprise believe, it may not necessarily be obvious to everyone engaged in developing the new economy. Over the next 12 months or so, the Global Weather Enterprise Forum and the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery will explore the social, economic, technological and scientific challenges that lie ahead and the climate smart actions we need to take. Through a series of roundtables, webinars, interviews, panels and podcasts, we'll look at nature-based solutions to water issues, energy demand and production in the new economy, city living and food production. I'm Masha Bagdanova and by way of an introduction to our first roundtable, I've conducted two brief interviews to set the scene for our discussion. Both are with the economists Stefan Halligate of the World Bank and Johannes Lin of the Brookings Institution. First of all, let me welcome Stefan Halligate. Stefan, you are the most senior climate change advisor to the World Bank and your leading research, which has a big role in shaping the contemporary vision of the economics of natural disasters and risk management, and also of climate change policies. But you're also very familiar with the world of meteorology, having spent many years working for Meteo France and recently as a board member. Building on these two chapters of your professional life, let me ask you a few questions about what you think the future holds. First of all, we know the world's economies have to decarbonize and that we all should work towards building a new decarbonized economy. In this new economy, how would you characterize the role and importance of hydrometeorological data information and services? Well, I think if we if we look ahead for, I don't know, 2030 or 2040, uh, and an economy that is becoming decarbonized, but also greener, and, and, and greener means more efficient. All of that, if you think of agriculture, uh, means that using less entrant, using less water in buildings, it means using less energy for heating and cooling. All of that always require a much better control of the, of the environment and better knowledge about not only the weather and the climate now, but also being able to, to, to predict it. So this efficiency that we will have to see everywhere in the economy will make the availability of weather data and forecasts even more important. There is another dimension, which is the use of renewable energy. And as you know, the renewable energy cannot be dispatched. You turn not on and off a, a, a wind or solar. So it's cheaper, but it requires to anticipate much more the supply that will be available and the demand for energy and being able to adjust our demand to the supply that will be available. Again, to do that efficiently, we need very good weather information and, and, and forecasts. And finally, we, we think we'll use more and more what we call nature-based solutions. So not trying to uh, use infrastructure, hard infrastructure for everything, but uh, managing floods, for instance, with a mix of wetlands and dikes. And again, when we rely more on nature, we have to know it better and weather information will, will play a bigger role in there. So this, this green growth that we're all after is much more dependent of being aware of our environments and being able to forecast it. So the role of hydromet will, will of course increase. And we can talk about the other side of the coin, which is living in a world that's changing because of climate change, uh, which means that we need to monitor what's going on much better to see if something changes in ways that we did not expect so that we can adjust to it. And the world probably with more natural disasters uh, making early warning systems and the ability to act upon them uh, more important. Again, here, hydromet services will, will play a key role. 
So I, I see only growth in that sector uh, when I look at 2030 and, and, and 2050 with, with a much more central role interacting with all of the sectors of the economy. Moving on, let's take a look at the relationship between the global weather enterprise, which we define as an engagement of the players in the public, private and academic sector and the new decarbonized economy. How do you think this global weather enterprise should be structured to best help maximize the efficiency and economic benefits arising from the new decarbonized economy? So it's, it's, it's a very good question because the, the sector has been changing very, very fast. Uh, in most countries, the hydromet was a public service, and now we see much more capacity and uh, services provided by, by the private sector. And like always, when you have big changes, uh, we have to just adjust the way we regulate and, and manage the sector so that we can benefit from the value added of the private sector and articulate it with what the, the public sector is, is providing. I think one thing important to start from is that this is not unique to the hydromet sector. Uh, if you look at education, health, transportation, in all of the sectors, we also have a mix of public and private actors, and we have experience in regulating the interactions with, with those sectors. So I think that the first key ingredients is to not to, to and step away from this competition with different actors providing the same services to try to find the comparative advantage of a different uh, type of provision so that we can benefit from who, whoever is best to, to produce different things. You ask about the model, I don't think there is one model that will be used everywhere because it's so linked to institutional traditions in countries. I mean, we, we have countries much more centralized, others much more decentralized. We have uh, countries where the public sector is playing a bigger role than in others. So I don't think there is one model that we can just put in all countries and it's going to work. Everything needs to start from the current situation and build on it depending on, on the strength and the, uh, the, the, the culture, institutional culture in, in countries. But there are two dimensions that are really important. One is uh, that hydromet services will be used for their economic value uh, by many firms, many households, but there is also a public responsibility linked to the safety, like early warning system, natural disasters, and the monitoring of the environment, which is a responsibility of the public sector in most countries. So one, one first thing that we need to do is to ensure that we maximize the economic benefits of the commercial parts while reinforcing the ability of the whole system to deliver on safety, uh, early warning systems, and monitoring of the environment. Um, the second dimension that's really important is this trade-off between funding and accessibility. So if you have a forecast, its value is maximized if everybody has it. So you want to make it available for free to anyone, the easiest possible way. If you do that, you're left with a funding challenge. So there is this tension. We want to generate flow of revenues so that we can fund the infrastructure, uh, the observation systems, the satellites, computing, and so on. But at the same time, we want the end product to be available for all at the lowest possible costs. Uh, so it, it calls for very different uh, funding mechanisms that again will be different across countries. Some countries might be able to use taxpayer money for all of the basic infrastructure. Some countries might not be able to do that. Uh, so in some cases, you will have some mixed hybrid models with some part that's commercial and some, some parts that's, uh, that's a public service. Uh, this is something that really needs to be designed at the, at the country level. But we have to, in, to invent the right regulatory uh, mechanism to, to make sure we, we combine private and public sector here. Thanks for this great food for thought, Stefan. We'll be following up on your comments during the panel session. Now, let me welcome Johannes Lin. Johannes, you're an economist with many years of experience in development finance and more recently in climate finance too. You chaired the first Green Climate Fund replenishment in 2019, and since 2021, you've served as the global facilitator for the Systematic Observations Financing Facility, also known as SOF. 
So you have a good overview of some of the key aspects of the global and national weather and climate enterprise. Let me start by asking you, why should policymakers and decision makers care about weather and climate services? Well, thanks, Anna Maria, and uh, it's a great pleasure to join you today and join this conversation. Uh, maybe just to clarify, you know, until about a year and a half ago, I I really had no idea about meteorology. I knew just what I saw on my cell phone, and I was always impressed by how accurate, uh, in many ways, these predictions were in terms of the weather uh, for the next two or three days. But I also, of course, realized beyond that it was pretty, pretty weak. Uh, so it got weaker as the days went out. Now, when I joined the effort to uh, raise money for the Systematic Observations Financing Facility, or SOF, uh, about a year and a half ago, I had to learn very quickly some basic elements of meteorology. And, uh, you know, I've become very impressed uh, with and really uh, a, a committed to the agenda that uh, our policymakers nationally, uh, but also internationally, both in sort of the development uh, space, uh, uh, but also in the in the climate space have to be much better informed about how important weather and climate prediction, weather and climate services, leading to weather climate prediction, and then the downstream elements in the hydromet uh, value chain, how, uh, how important the upstream uh, hydro, hydromet uh, um, information and data are. And so, uh, so okay, why, why does it matter? Well, it matters because every day or every hour even of improved uh, prediction uh, helps you uh, take steps to actually address uh, potential negative impacts or for that matter, positive impacts in uh, terms of how you can react as a farmer, how you can react if you're in the transport business, uh, for example, uh, um, airplanes depend of course on weather forecasts, wind and what have you, Shipping depends on it. So accurate forecasts of weather is critical for many economic actors. Climate accurate climate prediction, of course, and measurement actually what's happening on the ground is critical, of course, for us to take appropriate action, both in terms of mitigation and in terms of uh, uh, adaptation. So I've become convinced that without good data, we don't have good prediction. Without good prediction, we can't take adequate action in a, uh, in a uh, timely manner. And I can give you an example of very personal. Uh, I, uh, I spend quite a bit of time on a, a lake in upstate New York, uh, right by the water. And I've noticed that the water goes up and down because it's being regulated. Well, when you have big storms, and we had big storms last summer in the area, come, you need to have that information days ahead of time to adequately regulate the water level. If you don't, and we had a problem with that last, uh, last year, uh, we actually have serious flooding. And of course, that's just a small example of how similar problems occur elsewhere. Now, the reality is that uh, the, the biggest bang for the buck in terms of improved weather forecasts and climate prediction can actually come from better data in the uh, least developed countries and in the uh, uh, small and uh, developing island states because they currently are the least uh, well served in this regard and can benefit directly, but also actually improved observations in these countries will help improve up, uh, weather prediction and climate prediction in the uh, OECD countries. And therefore, I believe it's very important that national policymakers in both the advanced countries and in the developing countries pay more attention to weather observations, meteorological observations, and hydromet, uh, uh, the hydromet um, uh, agenda than has been the case so far. And I'm a good example of this because, as I said, I've been in the development business, including at the World Bank as a vice president in charge of operations, and I never paid attention to uh, the hydromet uh, uh, sector. And if you'd asked me, uh, two or three years ago, is it important? I would have said no. So we have a big job to do. We have to educate people. We have to educate policymakers. We have to ed educate the average citizen for why this is important. And I hope to contribute to that. And I hope this conversation will contribute to that. Thank you. Moving on to my second question. 
We know that the world's economies have to decarbonize and we should all work towards building a new economy. In this new economy, how would you characterize the role and importance of hydrometeorological data information and services? Right. Well, let me give you, um, let me start that part of the conversation perhaps with a broader reflection on the international climate architecture, which uh, is, is important here because Hydromet services and hydromet the hydromet uh, uh, global hydromet architecture is really embedded in the broader uh, global climate and development architecture. So, if you look at the climate finance space, you currently have a proliferation and fragmentation that is quite striking. So, you have the Green Climate Fund, which is perhaps the newest organization funding climate uh, investments. You have the so-called SIFs, the climate investment funds. You have the adaptation fund. You have UNEP and UNEP, the traditional UN organizations. You have the global environmental facility. You have World Bank, the other multilateral development banks. You have uh, uh, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. You have bilateral donors. You have foundations such as the New Business Foundation. Uh, all of them are engaged in this climate finance space, trying to do things in terms of investing in both in mitigation and in adapt adaptation. And, uh, uh, you know, in a way replicating a pattern of fragmentation in the development finance space that we've had for years. Uh, for example, in the health sector at the country level, you have multiple organizations dealing with trying to help countries improve their health sectors. Well, we now have the same problem, if you wish, or opportunity, one could also say, in terms of climate finance. And indeed, it could be an advantage because with more organizations working in climate finance and providing finance, you get more funds, you get more technical expertise, you can fill certain gaps, uh, gaps that might occur. But fundamentally, again, uh, looking at it at the, from the recipient country perspective, you have a tremendous problem of coordination, of making sure that actually the, the interventions are part of a larger plan and aren't uh, driven by individual donor interests purely, for example, or by individual ministries' interests. So we have a real problem here of fragmentation. And the question is, you ask, so what can be done about it? Well, uh, in the development uh, uh, space, we have development finance space. We've had considerable efforts at donor coordination, for example, together with country program uh, formulation by the countries and strategy formulations by the countries themselves. That has been a mixed success so far. And so it is a, going to be a big challenge to get all these different uh, finance actors to come together, including, of course, also private finance uh, actors. However, maybe the solution to that is actually something which South Africa has put together uh, in connection with the preparation for COP26, which is to have the South Africa climate pl a country platform, as it's sometimes called. And what you have here is the, a program which brings together key donors who put in a clearly uh, identified amount of money, actually significant multi-billion dollar program of uh, external finance to help South Africa uh, implement a well-defined program of mitigation as well as adaptation. And this is probably, it's this kind of really country focused uh, programming and, uh, and uh, coordination effort, which is required and has to be replicated elsewhere. Thank you, Johannes and Stefan for your thoughts on the challenges facing the global weather enterprise as it positions itself to help address the evolving needs of business and society over the coming decades. So, having touched on the importance of weather and climate information to help manage the future economy, the challenging roles of different actors, and the challenge of financing the enterprise, let's look at these issues in more detail with our distinguished panelists. So, interviews gave us a lot of points to discuss, a lot of things to unpack. Um, I would like to ask our esteemed panelists to first share their reactions, responses. Um, since South Africa was mentioned, I think Jerry will start with you. Um, you you've had it all, so I'll just I'll just briefly read it. So it, you've been an assistant secretary general and deputy secretary general of the WMO, 
a former CEO of the South Africa Weather Service, and CEO is not a very traditional way to call this position, so that's an interesting moment. Um, you have master's degree in climatology and in public and development management, and right now you are the director and founder of Disaster Risk Solution, an international consulting company based in Johannesburg. Um, Terry, um, what do you think? Uh, what's your what's your take on what you just heard from all the all the experiences that you've had? Thank you very much, uh, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, so, interesting topic, and uh, listening to the introduction as well um, uh, from GFDRR has been a very interesting one because uh, in the context especially of the IPCC report, which has just been released, um, on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, uh, which uh, in a sense calls us from going from urgent uh, to timely to timely actions uh, on a number of fronts. One is on governance, uh, the other is on finance, uh, on knowledge and capacity, uh, as well as technologies um, amongst others. Um, and I think all of these do present an opportunity for the weather enterprise, and I emphasize weather enterprise, not just uh, uh, one part of it, which often is government when we speak uh, of weather services, but, but, but the weather enterprise as a whole. Uh, there's a great opportunity for us to contribute uh, to a climate resilient development. Uh, emphasis on that, because I think that one of the key issues that we face is in the decade or so, in fact, in the less than decade remaining to 2030, um, where 1.5 seems to be the reality and probably beyond, which means increase in extremes and extreme events, um, which define in a way whether events in the short term define the long-term climate regime, right? Uh, because that's all that climate is, is a long-term average of weather conditions over a period of time uh, means that you know we we are <clears throat> one lens of looking uh, at what the future of the weather enterprise should be uh, and its contribution to a climate resilient development means that we have to use the risk and impact lens uh, to economies rather than the traditional way uh, in which we have only looked at it in respect of saving lives. Uh, and then we later on added lives, uh, uh, livelihoods uh, to that. I think uh, it has to go to risks to uh, an impact on, on economies. Now, the new economy, uh, let me take a slightly different slant uh, to how it was defined earlier, and, and uh, not that it, it, that was not correct, um, but that one of the things about the new economy uh, is, is certain characteristics around it, including one, for example, which is that it is decentralized, right? A lot of emphasis on decentralization. For example, someone did mention energy generation at a very localized scale. And right? so that instead of having this big infrastructure where we are de dependent on centralized energy generation, uh, that we can in fact have more decentralized systems. Uh, so decentralized, uh, data-driven, um, for example, the current technologies and growth in artificial intelligence and in cloud computing, uh, which are opening up opportunities for even least developing countries or, 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 or less developed countries to have access to computing capability without the requisite normal investment in supercomputers, for example, is starting to open up a whole new avenue of the possibility to run models at very localized scales, again, decentralized. Um, and then, of course, the new economy is technology driven. Uh, um, there's blockchain technologies, there's uh, APIs and all kinds of technologies that are making uh, democratization, if you want to call it, of knowledge, uh, of the generation of knowledge and information, even much more a reality than it was in the past. So in the context of a changing climate and certainly uh, risks and impacts being very localized, the traditional method, allow me to use a phrase, uh, the traditional method of spray and pray uh, and hope that this information does reach someone and that someone knows what to do with it 
when they've received it, unfortunately, will not be uh, the reality in the next decade or even less because that traditional method of weather surface is operating at very low uh, density observation networks and at very low resolution uh, means that it, it can no longer be a viable uh, system for, for uh, early warning systems because we would need localization and certainly uh, the growth of technologies and, and uh, especially in the new economy are even going to be more important. So new, new opportunities, uh, of course, will require new capabilities across the weather enterprise and, and across all nations, whether they're developed, developing or, or least developed. And so in that respect, um, I would say that in, in, in the decade or less than the decade that remains, a, a concerted skills development effort is required, especially in developing at least developed countries. Um, uh, let me, let, and, and here's where the opportunity is in my view. The opportunity is that in most developing countries, the state continues to be, or governments continue to be the highest employer of highly skilled graduates in sciences and in other multidisciplinary areas. I think that in light of the new economy, it is quite important that we seek uh, to intervene with weather and climate services in, in, in creating the core skills that the new economy requires, as I defined it earlier, uh, but also including emphasis on governance, which then touches on policy and legislative interventions um, and services for this new economy and a climate resilient economy. Technology, um, as I said, AI, for example, and, and others um, which are key to the next decade and beyond. Uh, finance, um, someone mentioned the challenge of coordinating finance um, and often uh, the, on the government side, often the players do not have access to the finance guys um, in treasuries and so forth because they're quite uh, distant in that ecosystem uh, from the decision makers and often are not even connected in most instances to, to um, uh, finances that are directed at development, uh, at development financiers, for example. So the emphasis then on resilience uh, and certainly the emphasis on climate hazards and exposure means that there's an opportunity, I think, to, to turn that clock back and to provide emphasis on the management of risks uh, or understanding risks to economies that weather and climate present. And therefore, if we are able to offer viable risk assessments to governments, private sector, and the private citizen, then I think uh, the challenge that we have now of these traditional lines of what is the private sector and the public sector and the so-called public good, which um, can only be given by governments. I think that no, those notions need to be challenged uh, and certainly tend on their heads. Because I think that the, the time of citizens waiting to be told what to do by a state uh, in the face of extreme events and the kind of challenges that we have uh, in, in building a climate resilient economy, uh, those days in my view are gone and need to be challenged uh, in the way in which you make services accessible or weather and climate risk information and assessments available to everyone at the scale at which that they operate, at the very localized scale beyond even the 250 or 50 kilometer uh, square um, uh, resolution that we often work with at a level of models in, in the weather enterprise. So uh, my sense is that indeed the points raised about the weather enterprise needing to be much more relevant in the, in the current context, even more relevant uh, in the current context and in the future context uh, of climate risks that, that all economies face. It is important that we, the entire enterprise, both private, um, public, academic, also work hand in hand 
in ensuring that we, we can provide the right skill set uh, in those areas where it is most required across these three sectors uh, in ensuring that um, a, a climate resilient economy uh, can be built and can be supported by the weather enterprise in the future. So thank, thank you very much uh, for thank, the opportunity. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I would like to pass the word to Celeste, Celeste Saulo, um, who is the head of the uh, Argentina Meteorological, National Meteorological Service. And um, since 2018, she has been, uh, she has served as the vice president of the World Meteorological Organization. Um, and she represents here also an academia side of, of, of equation. So Celeste is a scientist in the field of meteorology, climatology, and numerical modeling with vast experience in research and teaching and mentoring. Celeste, um, give us your thoughts on first on what you heard, and also if you can um, kind of like try to give it also through the prism of academic sector. Thank you, Masha, and uh, good day to everyone. It's a pleasure to, to share with you this space. So, uh, just to go straight to the point that uh, you asked me, uh, from these very interesting interventions, I would like to pick out a couple of items. First, uh, I would like to stress the impact of fragmentation, this concept that has been raised by Johans. As the head of the National Weather Service, I can fully understand and illustrate the negative impacts of that fragmentation. What do I mean? Institutional arrangements are difficult when the recipients of funding have to report to different authorities, ministries, and so on. Usually, national med services in developing countries are not at the top of the pyramid in terms of level of authority. So, their participation can be disregarded or not acknowledged at all. You may have an authority at the level of a state or province that has direct access to funding from developing agencies. So, as recipients of funding, they make their own decisions and define their priorities without enough technical knowledge in terms of hydromet issues. As a consequence, they tend to start from scratch or tend to reinvent the wheel. That is expensive. It is not cost effective. And usually, when the term of their political office finishes, they can barely show modest levels of success. As a result, social perception of meteorology, its value, its impact, becomes downgraded. This negative feedback, what I mean is this negative feedback between high investments, sense of too much money spent with poor results, low appreciation of the value of MedInfo, so you need again more money and so on. This negative feedback may repeat forever. Unless funding agencies or donors or bilateral agreements help to improve these institutional arrangements. Uh, on the other hand, you have other possible uh, recipients of funding, the academic sector. This is a completely different actor. They know the state of the art, they will not reinvent the wheel, but chances of weak interaction with national med services are high and the effectiveness of these investments in terms of improved data and climate services will likely be very low. Again, this is a problem that critically affects less developed countries. Why is this so? Because unlike developed countries, there are no areas of research and development in a smaller national med and hydro services. So, the connection between the academia and the weather service is much more complicated. That is a real weakness for many national med and hydro services, and one I particularly care about, given my background, as you say, and my current experience. When the World Meteorological Organization 
through the research board and the technical commissions have the goal of strengthening the science for service concept. This is far from being achieved in let's say the next five to 10 years. Again, funding agencies have a critical role to play here. Let me finish this first uh, intervention by quoting some of the issues mentioned by Stefan. I couldn't agree more with him that there is no ceiling for growth of this sector if we secure the proper arrangements, regulations, and social awareness. This is particularly urgent under the paradigm of a decarbonized economy, a green economy that, that becomes even more fragile and exposed to natural hazards under a changing climate. In my view, there is room for growth if each player adopts the optimal behavior for the benefit of all and not for his own. In these regards, we must work together to raise the awareness of decision makers with respect to the sport, the importance of weather and climate information, and also pointing out the role that each player has in this game. As a global weather enterprise community, we should all raise our hands when we detect that the player is not on board. This should be a commitment of this community if we want to succeed in this enterprise. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Back to you, Marshall. Thank you, Celeste. Um, moving on to Peter, Peter Platzer, who is the CEO at Spire Global. Um, Pe uh, Peter was named by President Obama White House Champion of Change. Um, prior to launching Spire, um, he trained at the European Council for Nuclear Research and the Max Planck Institute. Um, in your um, in your background, you have from Wall Street to space industry, and you are a representative of this private sector, which is quite honestly sometimes even misunderstood in in some countries. So, um, what would you, what would you like to uh, to share in in as a reaction to what's been said before? No, thank you for 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 having me here and sharing you know with our personal views. And what is interesting is that, you know, you, you call me a, a representative of the private sector, and yet I will find myself, as you will hear, arguing vociferously um, for the public sector here. Um, uh, having, as you said, worked on Wall Street, I think we just look at, uh, at, at, the, at the geopolitical events happening right now. The belief that individuals will act in the interest of everyone and not themselves, I think, I think is just um, uh, not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, climate change is a classic uh, public good. Uh, and without the public sector stepping in and basically taking taxes and averting them uh, towards fighting it or policies that bring the externalities of climate change into the economic model, I do not believe the change will be made. And I think that's one of the core problems that I see that the public sector by and large has been long on discussion, forey councils, committees, and very, very short on action. Climate change is not a technology problem. It is not a science problem. The solutions exist to solve all of this. And I just wanna um, uh, bring the example of COVID where we saw humanity actually come together and deliver things that everyone thought absolutely impossible. Namely, within a new virus in a period of 18 months, that virus was a genome sequence that billions of people got vaccinated. That normally everyone said would take a decade. If humanity works together, it can actually solve these problems. But uh, the capitalistic side of the world will just not take up that, um, uh, that mantle. So uh, with the technology solutions being available, um, the cost for those technology solutions being minimal, um, I, I really feel that the, uh, uh, the prominence of the public sector, individually on a country by country basis and globally, has to be much larger. And that's where the global weather enterprise, I think, comes into play, because weather is another global commons. And other than um, environmental protection, which countries can do individually, it actually is one where individual countries they basically cannot solve it for themselves. They do need large cooperation. 
And so I think we can look at the last 30, 40, 50 years of the global weather enterprise and look at um, uh, activities, for um, uh, uh, organizations that have worked and those that have not worked in collaborating on a global basis and uh, finding the funding, which often is in the hundreds of millions of dollars on an annual basis. So I think the funding clearly exists if there is collaboration. And there is, I think, learnings to be had of what works and what doesn't work from the global weather enterprise. And unfortunately, and I might be here like the uh, the capitalistic cynic, I do not believe that without the public sector owning that role of um, uh, bringing externalities into a capitalist society, either through policies or through taxes, um, that, that this will keep on going for a substantial period of time and might become a runaway situation. Thanks, thank you, Peter. Um, I think you just set the scene for the completely different conversation we'll have to have at some point. Um, the, um, I would like to give a floor to uh, Nicole Ranger. Um, she's the head of sustainable finance research for development at the Oxford Sustainable Finance Group of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, University of Oxford. She's been with the bank um, for for some time, and right now she's um, she's gonna. Um, she, I, I would like to just basically kind of like summarize a little bit. Like we've heard a lot about climate finance. We've heard a lot about um, components of this global web enterprise. How do you see it from from your climate finance architecture experience? Thank you very much, uh, Anna Maria, and, and thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. But I, I, I want to give a little bit of a perspective as someone who comes from the development community, but but now works in the finance side. So, and particularly looking at climate data from a financial sector perspective. And I, I guess what what I'm seeing, and you know, I've been working in this area probably since about 2005, is a, a massive, massive change in. Uh, you know, what we're calling here the weather enterprise and we've talked a little bit about this you know we've talked about technology we've talked about the growing role of the private sector but but really i can i can't emphasize how, how enough how how fast a change we, we're beginning to see in these areas and and we've talked about some of the drivers for that um you know the the increasing demand from a whole range of economic sectors we've heard about energy you know, but now, you know, look across big multinationals who are using weather information to optimize their supply chains in real time. You know, this is this is a massive enterprise now. We're seeing infrastructure operators owning their own climate and weather information. Uh, we're, we're seeing a vertical consolidation in, in the market now for, for these types of firms. So, you know, recently uh, Moody's buying out risk management solutions, um, buying out also you know, various other data providers. So we're seeing this huge change um, in the market and I see um, opportunities from that. And I do want to talk about the opportunities, but also risks, particularly for um, emerging and developing economies. Um, so some of the, that some, just to sort of pick up this, this, particularly this area of demand from the financial sector, which I think is only just beginning to land. And I think is gonna drive this even more rapidly so you know we now have all the g7 countries um moving towards mandatory disclosure of climate risks by all large financial institutions so this is an, a significant portion of the global economy will be requiring climate data that never required it before and again this brings opportunities but also risks and i you know it's g7 countries but these are big global financial organizations that invest all over the world. So this will have big impacts on developing countries as well. Um, and what I see in terms of the opportunities then, so obviously firstly, you know, this massive demand for data is a huge opportunity for developing countries in, in particular. Um, you know, if I were an investor now, I would be investing in companies in developing countries that are providing this data. This is an enormous growth market. Um, but but also it brings uh, risks and what I see as some of the risks and, and we've talked about this 
link between the public and private sector and the risks of this decentralized approach. But what I really see, so when, when I see the way that the market is changing, you know, the risk of crowding out um, public sector financing. So if governments see that actually the private sector is providing more, if they actually start to pull back, and we've heard about how the public sector is so important in ensuring, you know, basic public services, early warning systems, the inclusiveness of this data. Um, so ensuring that the, uh, the poorest and most vulnerable people can benefit from this data. So that there's a risk there. Um, there's a risk in terms of misuse of this information. And we're already beginning to see this. So we're beginning to see investment being pulled out of areas that are seen as higher climate risk. Um, so that there, there's a there's I think potential um, parts of the world being left behind through um, misuse of weather information, and also a lack of transparency over the weather information. This is something that we're seeing. So we're seeing now weather information being baked into indices that corporates and financial institutions are using, and a real lack of transparency about that data and the quality of that data. And then that again, that can potentially lead into investments being drawn out of developing countries. So I think this is a really big issue. So there are opportunities um, and there are also risks. And then just finally coming on to this um, excellent point that Stefan made in about the financing mechanism. So I do think we need to think about new models for financing. We need to look at you know, how, how can we ensure that when private sector actors are investing in climate and weather information, that this is a public good as well. So how, you know, how can we look at um, bringing together new sources of financing from the private sector with a public good aspect, but then also importantly, scaling up the, the public sector financing side. And I really do feel that there's an important role for the multilateral development banks in this area in particular. So I'll stop there then. So, you know, there there is, to summarise, you know, a, a juggernaut is already moving very fast and it's going to be moving even faster in changing the weather enterprise. And this brings massive, bent, you know, potential opportunities for developing countries, but also some risks that we need to be looking at how we manage through good public policy and also through good public investment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, a, a lot of points have been picked up. Um, during the uh, during these interventions, um, I would probably just then um, use this opportunity and pass the uh, sort of ask the question to Stefan and um, building on what Nicola has said. So, um, new models for financing. Um, we have, I mean, we realize that we're in the environment when we have a lot of actors. We have national hydrometric services, private companies, universities, international development institutions, national finance authorities, and yet there is a sense that there is an element of disconnect between um, the decision makers or economic community, so to say, and the weather community. So uh, what can be done to bring these two together? Um, and to add, based on the questions that we have in the chat, and it's a pretty fascinating discussion that is happening there, so if you have a chance, scroll through it. Um, there is a, a lot of um, a driving force coming from the private sector, which is also slightly disconnected, or maybe not slightly disconnected from the formal climate finance architecture. So, what are those points and and and, and the opportunities to bridge this 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 element? So, a decision decision makers, economy, and weather community plus private sector and formal climate finance architecture. Uh, Stefan, if you want to, if you want to start. No, I, I can be, I can be short and it's, it's a really an important and interesting conversation. Um, I, I guess the first point I think we should really start from is this idea that a, a public good can be produced by the public sector or by the private sector. Uh, if, if you look at, at health, uh, private hospitals are providing a public goods, just re they're regulated to do that. And if you have a hospital in many countries, for instance, you cannot reject uh, people in your emergency room. Uh, so the, the, the right to have a business in health comes with obligations. And I think we can really think along the same lines for hydromet services that you might want to, uh, to, to build out this hybrid system, but provided that the regulations are such that you create those, uh, those public goods. Uh, I think Nicolas' point is really important and, and it's related to the discussion in the chat about how you make the need for these uh, services and information uh, clear also for ministries of finance and other, other players. 
the fact that investors are increasingly asking for hydromet and climate information and required to ask for it for disclosure uh, mandates um, means that for your economy, having this information uh, will, be, will be necessary. And I think we should really use that uh, line of argument uh, and the risk that Nicola uh, 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 emphasized. If, if, if as a country you're exposed to high risk and you cannot provide the right information, the risk is just to see investors go somewhere else. So it, it's, not, it's not only in this security issue that, that we had, there is also a huge, uh, a huge question for the, uh, for the finance. And I want to finish on, um, on, on the last thought, which is if, if you discuss hydromet services in, in Europe, for instance, um, you will have all of the security apparatus in the room. Um, there is also like a national security component, uh, both in terms of security of the people and, the, and, and properties, uh, but also in terms of knowing what's going on on your territory. Uh, so I think when we talk about the, uh, the, uh, the role of the private sector, we, we cannot completely ignore this, this dimension of uh, national security and, and being in control of this data, especially as it becomes more important for energy security, uh, national security and, 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 and finance. Um, so I think this link, this, this synergy between the public and the private sector will be achieved only if we recognize the, the specificity of this market and, and, and not ignore those, uh, those aspects. Uh, but I mean, that could be a much longer conversation. Um, I, I hope we can have it uh, in this series of, uh, of, of seminars. Thank you. I think the, the, the issue of incentives and creating the right framework for these incentives is something that should be addressed clearly. Um, Peter, the floor is yours. Just just two two small things I would say. Um, uh, the provision of public goods is always done by the private sector that is contracted by the public sector. And so there is a long and broad history, you know, um, someone mentioned hospitals of the public sector contracting the capabilities of the private sector to provide public goods. Um, uh, you know, we are doing this, you know, right now. And, and I think that is really not the bottleneck. Those mechanisms are really well understood of how uh, the public sector can contract with the private sector to provide a public good. Let's just look in a global better enterprise of any of the satellite programs all of those satellite programs are built by the private sector, right? And they provide a public good. So th that is really um, uh, a, solved, uh, a solved situation. And I think the other one that I, that I want to, to make, and, and, and uh, I'm, I'm sometimes surprised by that perception that we, we don't have the answers. Do we have the answers 100%? Absolutely not, right? And clearly this is an extremely complex um, interconnected um, uh, phenomenon, but we do have answers of what to do with like, you know, 80%. We could do this today. The technology truly, absolutely, unquestionably exists today to make a massive dent into the continuation of climate change, to drive the world towards net zero. Can we today create a plan to get us there with 100% certainty? No, we don't. We don't have the answers. But that is also not how progress is actually generally made. It is made through iterations. The cars that drive around the Formula One um, uh, circuit today have been iterated over the last 150 years from the first car that was being built. They didn't know how a Formula One car is going to look like when they started to build the first car. And we don't have to have all the answers today. Because I believe the one thing that we actually do not have is the time to keep on debating and discussing and trying to come up with the perfect answer rather than an answer that is shipped and implemented today. And for that, the technology, the skills, the answers do exist. Thank you. Um, uh, so just two, two points. So one is to, to um, build on uh, Peter's point that to re-emphasize that, you know, that the opportunities here are massive and yes, there are risks, but the risks are actually manageable and we know how to do it. Um, you know, they're, they're the same tricky issues that we deal with, but we know how to, we know how to manage these risks. And I think um, focusing on the opportunities and, and how we, how we get the most out of this is the key thing. My second point was around build, building on um, Jerry's point about 
capacity, which I think is absolutely essential, and the role of the different actors in this ecosystem. So we've talked a lot about government, we've talked a lot about the private sector, but actually there are a whole range of other actors. And I see, you know, Jano here from the Red Cross Climate Centre with us today, mm. which is a really important role. And so, and also want to give the example of my own centre, so which is a, I know is a UK example, but I think is something that could be translated. So in the UK, um, the government as part of our green finance strategy recognised that, you know, there was going to be this massive need for data and that the private sector plays a really important role in that, um, you know, particularly in, in weather and climate data, but also the need for um, other bodies and, and including academic institutions that are there to help provide this capacity and also transparency. So our role, so I work for the Centre for Greening Finance and Investment, is about working with the private sector and with the users of information to help create the transparency and build capability across all users. And I, you know, this is a UK example, but I think that model that we need these new institutions um, in developing countries as well that can help create that transparency, increase knowledge, increase ca capacity in this in this new world. Thank you. I think my, my point is very consistent is when we when we talk about this public private partnership, we often think about the supply side. And I think we should also discuss about the, the demand side in, in the sense of who will be using this data and how we can help uh, the, the public sector to use uh, this data properly, but also the private sector, because in many cases you, you have a lot of data, a lot of forecasts and projections available, uh, but it's, it's not being used because because it's not straightforward how to use it. So I I I, I don't know how that changes the the, the picture, uh, but depending on the countries, uh, it it makes sense to really focus on supply because if you don't have any supply, there is nothing to use. But I, I would say in many, many places, um, it's it's very much in the demand side and how this is being used that we can make some cheap efforts. And if you do those cheap efforts, you, you start the pump, right? People start to use things, they realize it's useful, they see the gains, and you don't have to write those papers showing the benefit cost ratio. People know that it's useful um, because they experience it every day. When this pump is not started, it's really, really difficult to make the case. And I mean, economic papers go only so far to, to do that. So I, I think this is really a four quadrant thing, supply, demand, public, private. And, uh, and often uh, we look only at part of this uh, full, uh, full uh, picture. Thank you very much for all the participants. It's been extremely fascinating discussion in this uh, very complex times, um, but it's um, it, it needs to take place more than ever. Thank you.